Look, I think um, Strike it's very, very overrated. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Strike Rate, the cricket analytics podcast. This is episode two of the podcast, and episode two of us talking about how to become a cricket analyst. I'm Jack Hope, and I'm joined by Dan Weston. How are you doing, Dan? Are you looking forward to getting into to episode two of our new podcast? Yeah, really, really excited. I think it's a great topic, and I'm looking forward to, to giving some views on that and to answering some questions. Yeah, so just a reminder to people, this is this is part two. So if you want to go back and listen to part one, we talked about the skills that you'd need and uh, how you might acquire them and and, and like the, the basic entry level stuff for becoming an analyst. In this show, we're going to talk about how you actually get a job. We'll talk about how Dan actually got got his job or his jobs. Uh, and we'll talk about like what actually happens on on day one. Uh, I suppose. As ever, we'll be breaking things into two parts. In part one, Dan and I are going to chat about it. Then in part two, it will be time for some interaction from our listeners and and followers, uh, whether they be on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, doesn't matter. Find us, search us out there. Dan is at SA Advantage. I'm at Jack Cope Zero. And, um, you know, get involved. Get involved with the podcast. Um, Final reminder. Uh, you need to like and subscribe to the the show too. That really helps us, um, gives us a little boost, gets the word out there, and uh, hopefully gets things snowballing a little bit. Um, Dan, I'm going to ask you a, a question here to to kick things off. The topic is is getting a job. How did you actually get your first job in cricket? I don't think I've ever asked you that before. Um, yeah, wow, that was back in the day. Now, so I I first started doing a li- little bit of freelance work with couple of counties so I think in episode one I talked about tagging random English players into different charts and analysis and articles and stuff like that and then I managed to get like a couple of captains county captains like reach out to me and ask me if, if I could have chats with them about about doing different things and then I just got employed a little bit just as like a kind of recruitment consultant if you like um uh, and then from there, I also got a little bit of work doing like pre-match packs and stuff for blast games, things like that. So I was I would do like analysis on your position, analysis on the venue, matchups, general strategy stuff, and and they were pretty happy with it all. Really, um, certainly, I would say that it's probably about ten percent of what I could do now, <laughs> but. but I think it was still like quite a long way ahead of what everyone else was able to offer at that point in time. Bear in mind, this was like you know seven or eight years ago, probably I suppose at some point, uh, uh, when when that was happening. Um, yeah, so that was that was how how I got into it. And then properly in terms of full time stuff, um, Paul Nixon got me into Leicestershire uh, and got me in, got me a kind of an in with the CEO. Uh, now that that CEO wasn't particularly interested in in what I could offer, I don't think they really saw the value of it. But then the CEO changed a year later, and they were much more kind of open minded towards what I could offer because he came from a football background. And you know how much more sort of developed the analytics industry is in football compared to compared to cricket, really. So, um, so I started working at Leicester. Um, be really honest, um, you know. It's still an uphill battle a lot of the time at that point. You're proving yourself. You, I, I generally do believe, and we'll talk about this a little bit. I think someone's asked a question on this later on. I do really believe that if you're not an ex-player, you've got to work twice as hard to, to get respect and, and kind of a voice, if that makes sense. So uh, in terms of like the evolution from the start to finish the projects at Leicester, it was, it was something that really developed a lot over time. And... By the end of the 2022 season, uh, I, I moved on from there. But certainly, the relationship that I had with Nico by that point was was really tight, and I felt that you know I had a really good voice with him. And tactically, we were really on the same page. He bought into what I could offer, both short term stuff in terms of recruitment, match analysis, but also long term stuff in terms of the identity and the brand of cricket that we wanted to play. You know, when I remember when I first started at Leicester, um, they had zero players in the hundred in that first draft, and I think when I left, they had quite a few more. 
because we were trying to play a different brand of cricket to when 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 I first started when I first went there that, that they were had already played if that makes sense, uh, and we were playing a, a brand of cricket that was more attractive and more competitive than it was a few years back. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the year I left it was, it was pretty sick. I, I think we were playing really really good cricket and uh, in the blast um, we we were. I think we were a match for anybody. We went, we were, we, I remember we went to Knots away and I felt like it was never in any doubt that we were going to win that game. And uh, if it wasn't for points deduction for like some ran, random like potting up procedure, which I think was, was really quite harsh, uh, then then Leicester would have qualified that year. And for, for bearing in mind, you know, that you rank all the counties in budget, Leicester would be, if not bottom, round near the bottom in terms of budget. So, to go to go to teams like Yorkshire and and Notts in in that 2022 season and beat them in their own backyard and if it wasn't for some minor technicality because someone had bowled too many no balls uh, you would have qualified I mean like that's I think it's a pretty massive achievement and, and an endorsement of the methodology that you're trying to bring um, so yeah pretty long answer and obviously then I went to Kent subsequently so I've been at Kent since uh, end of 2022. Um, obviously had hundred stuff as well, so I started off. I, I think my claim to fame was that I was actually the first non-general manager employee of any team in the hundred. Um, so that was that was that was useful. Um, so uh, yeah, th- that was so that was 2019, almost five years ago. Um, yeah. so the first draft 2019, and then the tournament obviously got postponed because of all the COVID stuff. So we didn't actually play that first season until 2021. So it's a long wait from the first draft to the first yeah. match of almost two years. <laughs> <laughs> so so play, players' levels changed a little bit by that point. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, that was that was a good process. I actually really enjoyed it. And I think that, that that was the first process that I had really in terms of building a squad from the ground up and you know when you've got nothing you have literally zero players and how do you build a team from scratch and and i think even now in franchise leagues teams do have to do that so this, i think the skills that that i developed from doing that and then the mega auction with punjab in 2022 as well i think that again punjab only retained man Agarwal and arshdeep singh two players so i went to an auction essentially looking for a maximum of 23 more players building a team from scratch is an amazing project and you can really stamp your identity and what you want to try and achieve on in that environment where you've got you're not really having to deal with other people's mistakes you know like you've got there's certain situations whereby you know you're joining a team particularly in cancer cricket this might happen and certain players that you think that you want to move on but they've got like three-year contracts and stuff so it's not like football where like you know you can sell a, a player to like a team in a division below or two divisions below or whatever you can't do that really in cricket it doesn't really work like that so, um, yeah, it's so sometimes going into an existing team is actually more of a challenge than starting a team from scratch. If we're talking about getting a job, in, in the first episode, you talked about what other people should do uh, in terms of of getting the word out there. Fanalytics, I think, was the, the term um, <laughs> that we, we, we settled on in the end. Um, if you're if you're somebody out there who's doing that, you're making some visualizations. You've got a bit of a Twitter profile. Would you would you still expect to have to reach out to teams or players to to actually get yourself a job, or or do you think that is an, an end in and of itself? Um, I think that in my experience, I think we sort of touched on this a bit in episode one, is that reaching out to people tends to be a pretty soul destroying process. Um, because the chances of you getting a, one a reply and two a reply that you want to hear is extremely low. You know, you're talking one in a hundred at best to get those two things in, in conjunction with each other. And, and yeah, it's it's very very difficult. So, like I, I said in episode one, I tagged a lot of people in, so then they come to you rather than you go to them. And but it is such an unforgiving process. It really really is. It's just tough. It's so difficult. Um, so, I mean, you can reach out to teams, you can reach out to managers, you can reach out to to captains or whoever you want to reach out to, and there's nothing stopping you doing that, but just don't expect much. So there, there's a few tactics that I, I've tried to implement with very, very mixed results. Um, 
I have, I remember, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the, I laugh now because this was about three years ago. I wrote a review document for an IPL franchise. And I mean, I could do a better job now, but it was still at that point, I think, for really, really high level compared to what was on the market. And it was post-season. They just got a new coach. I thought, that's a great time to do this, right? Bear in mind, this is like 20, 30 pages. I can't remember, but it was pretty thorough. Recruitment strategy, gap analysis, you name it, was doing it, yeah? I didn't even get a reply from the coach. But that, that, I mean, like, that took me days. I'm not joking. So I guess unless you really, really love doing this, don't invest days and days of your time on a spec message to someone. Let's talk about the the market a little bit then. Um, one of one of the notes that you put down for us to talk about is how competitive it is. But if we are, if we're yeah. looking across cricket, we've got all these different franchise leagues. Realistic, ha- realistically, uh, how many analyst jobs are out there? And, and in, in you know your experience, how many analysts are there looking for these jobs? Um, the jobs, in terms of the jobs are out there, I mean, it's really tough to say because they don't tend to get advertised. Um, so like you could, you could go on like a website like cricket jobs or something and you probably wouldn't find one that would be remotely of interest at any time. And I check it semi-regularly. I never really see anything that's just worth my time like, applying, applying for or anything like that, but definitely not a franchise level anyway, for sure. A lot of it, unfortunately, and it's a, it's a thing I don't like, it is about who you know and kind of the uh, relationships that you build. Um, you know, this, this is tough. It is tough, um, to, to even know that a job exists. So I, 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 for example, this winter, I mean, I haven't looked at stuff this winter at all because I've been really, really ill as an hospital for two months. So winter work wasn't my priority, but there was jobs going that I know would end up being filled. I didn't even know it existed at the time. So like, you really do need to have like such a close network of, of people who tell you about these type of things. I think that this is all snowballs for actually when you get that first job. Because if you get that first job, then you can build relationships with with people who who then you start building up a bit of a contacts book. Uh, and, yeah, really, really get more knowledge of, of, of the industry and opportunities and even just gossip and stuff like that and understanding where opportunities might come. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of actually how many jobs are out there, not many. Uh, how many analysts are out there competing for it? That's a really good question. I think that there's thousands of people who probably would, would love to do it. In terms of serious competition, I don't know, 20, 30? Yes, yeah, so it's still quite, you know, I, I guess that speaks to your point about getting the first job being the 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 biggest hurdle. Because I, I, I suppose until you've actually got that first job, you're not really a cricket analyst, are you? You're somebody who... <laughs> Who wants to be a cricket analyst? A uh, uh, final question on on like how the employment sector works, and and, and a few people have sort of asked questions around this. But like, do you need yeah. an agent to 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 get subsequent jobs? I'm assuming you you probably don't have an agent going into the the industry in the first place. But once you've established yourself to some extent, is that is that something that that you'd look to do or you have done? Uh, yeah, that, and that's a really really good question. Um, Look, I think, as you say, before you get a job, there's very little point in in having an agent. I think once you get a job or you get offered a job, I think it starts to become a more realistic consideration. Um, primarily because or I'll talk about my own personal circumstance uh, and people can then kind of reflect on that a little bit, is that as a person, I'm not that comfortable talking about money. So and negotiation is not really my area of expertise. I kind of can be probably perceived to be a bit of a pushover sometimes in those type of environments, especially if it's a job that I really, really want. So having a kind of a third party, if you like, who takes the heat off you from, from that side of things and will negotiate on your behalf is a really good thing. Someone who and you'll delegate essentially you're delegating to an expert right it's no different to like a coach delegating the analyst work to an analyst you're asking a specialist to help you and i think that that's actually can be really useful now what i will say is that a lot of teams hate dealing with agents like they'd much rather go to the analyst directly but then that's where sometimes you get not the best deal 
um, there's stuff that an, an agent will put in a contract that is they're, they're forward thinking basically. So they might put stuff in like even just little things like mileage allowances and bonuses and things like that. All stuff that perhaps when you're negotiating contracts, I, I remember negotiating that first contract to Leicester, I didn't even think about stuff like that. I did it all myself. And then actually when you when you realise what an agent can help you with, like it's actually probably blow your mind the first time you actually deal deal with them in that respect. So I would recommend it if you're a regular a regular analyst doing leagues, definitely. Um, they'll get you better deals. Uh, they'll make sure that even just little things like if you're going overseas, they'll make sure you get business class flights. So I, I remember negotiating with with one team about a business class flight, for example, and like there was a no, there was a non negotiable for me. I'm like if you're if you're expecting me to land at the airport and then start work the very next day, I'm 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 going to be sleeping on that flight. I'm going to be sleeping on a bed. And, and and that's a non-negotiable for me. You know, I'm six foot three as well. I don't want to be in the economy. What do I want to do that for? Uh, and I, I think it's basically just professional, really. If you're all traveling for work, you should be in business class. That you're traveling for business, right? Yeah. But, but I know someone else who was in a similar role who got economy because they didn't even think about that type of thing. And then and then I get said. And then the the owners was like, "Don't tell him that. Don't tell him that." I paid for you to go business. And I'm like, <laughs> we're going to be at the same airport at the same time on the way home. <laughs> you've, got, you've got telling me to pay out of your own money. <laughs> but, but I obviously didn't. Yeah. So, so like this is, yeah, these, that's the sort of stuff that agents can really help you with. Just the little things that you probably don't think about when you're negotiating a contract. You know, when you're negotiating a, a deal with someone, you've got, let's say they're offering you X amount of money. You're just thinking, how much is that per month? Can I pay my mortgage with that? Can I pay my bills on that? Stuff like that. You don't think, okay, well, how, much, how about I get 10%, 15%, 20% of my salary if we win the comp? Stuff like that, you know? Little little, little bits and pieces actually can really, really help you. And as well, I mean, like, an agent can really help you in terms of getting your name out there to to, to teams as well. Um, it's definitely still not an easy, an easy process, but it's definitely not a bad thing. They've got relationships with owners. They've got relationships with coaches, relationships with captains or whatever. It can help you. So I think once you've got that first job, I think it's a really serious consideration. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting in general. It, 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 it makes me think we should speak to an uh, an, an, an agent at some answer. point. It's, it's probably quite an unknown part of well, it's sports business in general, but cricket business. In, in football, they're always known as Mr. 10%, aren't they? And I, I read a really good article a few years ago now by an agent who basically like it's, it's quite a simple concept he was like why would you expect you know erling Haaland to know what his market value is his job is kicking a ball in a goal like he doesn't understand what he should be paid he doesn't understand how much revenue he is worth he doesn't understand image rights he doesn't he doesn't, he doesn't have a concept of, of all of these things like he would if he was left to negotiate himself he'd still be paid pretty well like he's not an idiot but as you're saying, there's all these other elements to to mm. this business that a specialist will know about, and Erling Haaland won't. Uh, Dan, last question before we we that subject as well. Sorry, um, with yeah. um, that that side of things, I don't know if you read an article. Or definitely, anyone who's watching this or listening to this would definitely recommend googling it if you're interested. Is about the Kevin De Bruyne story, where and it's very parallel to what you're saying about Erling Haaland. Where he, he, Kevin De Bruyne actually got an analyst to show that he was in the top X percentile of certain things. And then this was the wage that these people were getting. And he took the analyst into his contract negotiations. And basically, he got X amount of money more because of the tangible evidence that he was able to supply in those contract negotiations. So while he was, I think, from memory in the, in the article, he was very, very demanding in terms of his salary. He had the evidence to back up why he was being so demanding. So it kind of takes the emotion out of the situation a little bit. Mm. Because if he walked in, for example, and turned around and go, what, 300 grand a week? They're like, what? But he's like, <laughs> well, actually, X, Y, Z gets 300 grand a week, and I'm better than them. But suddenly that, yeah. that takes that takes a different course, that, that discussion. And I thought from memory, I, I, I vaguely remember the analyst 
some, I think he gets paid like one percent of or, or half a percent of his wages, basically. It's a pretty good like gig. Fifteen hundred a week. Yeah. <laughs> gig if you're doing that yeah not too bad <laughs> passive income and um, so yeah on that subject if anyone uh any player wants me to uh do that for them or any <laughs> age <laughs> uh dad last last question then um and i will be brief on this because we've got a few questions about it like later in the show as well what what actually happens when you get a job so we've talked about the different avenues in and yeah, you know, having an agent and this that and the other but like when when you're actually in the office with the mm-hmm. the coach on day one, what's that like, and and what are your first steps in 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 the in that role? I think it's really really difficult to give a standard answer to this because every coach is different. So, I mean, like I've I've worked with quite a few different coaches, whether they're head coaches or assistant coaches or skills coaches, and the start of a job would have been different for every single one of them if you're working with them. So it's it's not standardised at all. It's not, you know, use the Moneyball video, uh, film stuff, but it's not like Peter Brown going into his office on day one and crunching numbers and Billy walks in and goes blah, 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 blah. It's not like that. So some some coaches will be very fascinated with what you can offer and, and, and really just keep hammering on these questions to you. Other coaches will not be so interested. So it's a lot of it's reading the room. And now, from my personal side of things, it would be working out in advance who you work for. I've, I've, I did one role and it taught me a lot in terms of dealing with coaches who just don't care what you, what you can offer them. And, and so understanding, doing a bit more due diligence about who you're working with is, is definitely something that's worthwhile. Don't just take a job because you're getting off with a job. If you're, if you're, if you're working with a coach who like, couldn't even care, couldn't care less about the stuff that you're saying, then that's a massive problem. And 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 you could probably also say the same thing about captain as well, because ultimately a captain in cricket is making a lot more decisions than a captain would in football. So they're more powerful in terms of decision making process. You've got to know who you're working for, what their limitations are, how you're going to communicate with them, and and, and whether that can be effective. Because let me tell you, flying overseas and doing a comp over a long period of time. For a coach who doesn't care about what you can do is not a fun experience, let me tell you. I um, think I know who you're talking about there, but we'll keep it a secret. Um, yeah. You know what you think. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Uh, great. That's, that wraps up part one. Uh, in part two, we'll get back to some of your questions. We've got five or six in, um, so that should actually leave us with a nice show. And, and I think by the end of that, Dan, we should have answered the question, uh, how, how do you become uh, a cricket analyst? Welcome back, everyone, to Strike Rate, the Cricket Analytics podcast with me, Jack and Dan. Uh, just a reminder to listeners, make sure you're clicking that follow button. We want to build an audience as quickly as possible here. Same goes to those people over on Spotify. And uh, check us out on Twitter. I'm at Jack Hope Zero, and Dan is at SA Advantage if you want to get involved and ask a question yourself in one of the next shows. Or, you know, if you're on YouTube, leave us a comment. Um, we'd be really interested to hear what you think um we get some questions now i'm gonna start with Stuart, who asked us a question on twitter and uh i think it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek but it's 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 relevant to our conversation he asked uh, do you have to be related to someone already in cricket or be an ex-player in order to become an analyst um i wouldn't say it's necessary but it helps <laughs> um <yeah. laughs> certainly having an in into the industry in advance of starting a journey is is no doubt hand, handy and you yeah, exploiting someone else's or your from playing career contact book is is huge in that respect uh the true analyst it's a bit like it's a bit like playing fifa where you uh you don't buy any packs what do they call it uh, it's uh like a road to glory you you no got to do it hard. yeah yeah no no financial outlay yeah apart from buying the yeah. game yeah only the packs you get from like SPCs and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, that's the true analyst, right? The one who's worked up from scratch. Um, yeah, it, it it does it does really help having an in, in in the industry. One captain once said to me, "If you're, I won't say who he was, but he said, if your name was X, 
you would have a job offer from every single county. And I think that that really, and that the, and that X is now a DOC at a county. So go figure. Yeah. No, I'm sure. I, like, I'm sure it's got to be a little bit frustrating sometimes. So it, it's not. It's probably not unlike most sports uh, in that way. I mean, like we we talked about baseball as the the kind of gold standard. That's the only one that really, off the top of my head, maybe maybe it's starting to filter into some of the other American sports as well, where um, there are now really established routes in to these positions, which don't involve having played the game at a high level and yeah. or knowing somebody uh, in in the game. Um, Ashwin on Twitter, not that Ashwin, um, <laughs> a, a different one, <laughs> asks, does a guy need to play cricket to become an analyst or can anyone from a, a technical data domain be an analyst regardless of their cricket experience? So that's probably like a, a, a slightly different twist on the the same the same question there if we focus on the technical dom- data domain like if you were going to look at it from that point of view like, like how would you break in if you knew you had the skills um we've we've yeah. talked about your route in but if we take this from a, a different perspective let's say you are somebody who's like a, a, a coding wizard and mm. has you know built their database using r and they've you know they've found some really interesting things about who has the best slower ball or whatever it is. How do they get that in front of somebody that, that is one of those decision makers? It's so difficult. Like gen- genuinely is really, really tough. I also already said about the content side of things to kind of get, try and help. I mean, like there's, you could, if you want to go it, it kind of an off piece kind of way, why don't you just try and rock up to like team hotels or something like that and, 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 and end up putting yourself in front of I don't know. Like literally, like, I mean, I've never done it, right? But I, I would back myself if you gave me twenty minutes with a coach. I would back myself for, for them to turn around and go, "You, you actually, good. you know what you're doing." But it's getting that twenty minutes. That is, that is the, the key. You know, like I, I've been following like all these American kind of out of the box businessmen on Twitter at the moment, and like they did crazy stuff to get noticed. Like one guy wrote a book. But he didn't have a publishing deal, self so published it. And all he did was just like bombard all the books book the bookstores with um requests for that for that book. And then they really they ended up stocking it because everyone was asking for it. Stuff like that. So he got he got a big unconventional and think outside the box a little bit. Another one knew that the person he really wanted a meeting with um really liked Air Jordans. So he sent him one Air Jordan in the post and said, Meet me meet me for lunch next week, can you get the other one? And like stuff like that. So like you've got, to, you've got to think of it in like a really unconventional way. Does that mean you rock up at a team hotel? Does it mean you somehow have got to get yourself in front of a coach or an owner or something? Like, I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head how someone might do it from from scratch. Very difficult. I know there's a really interesting story along the same lines as this. Um, from, from baseball, there's the the current New York Yankees pitching coach, Danilo Valiente, is a Cuban guy. And I he found that there was a Yankees exec that went on the same walk or Strava run every morning at spring training at yeah. six in the morning. And he he thought he had something to offer. And so he basically timed his run to meet to, to bump into this yeah. guy had like a conversation with him and was like yeah i used to play baseball in cuba and I, i'm a coach and this that and the other was uh interesting enough that the 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 yankees exec invited him along to a spring training session and um ended up ended up getting a job so like it's not i think what we're saying here from the sounds of things is it's not a standard industry in terms no. of um, how, how yeah. you uh how you might break in uh let's talk about some well, let's do some questions about yeah the the role itself, and and I think some of these will spin out into to bigger episodes in the future. So make sure, as I said, you're you're clicking like and subscribe. Uh, Michael from Twitter says uh, that he would be interested to know how you've gone about developing relationships with players and whether there any there are any challenges telling them things they don't necessarily want to hear. So that's got to be like you know day one mm. something that you're you're going to have to confront if you are an analyst. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's a lot of different things that go into answering this question. Um, on a broad point, uh, I, I tend to wait for players to come to me rather than me forcing myself on a player. 
Um, I would say that the general rule, though, is definitely not 100% applicable, is that the younger the player, the more interested they might be. Um, but so I wait for them to come to me. And because they come to you, then you've kind of got the scope to be a little bit more honest with them because they've asked you for the information. But I always probably get in something like, look, what I'm going to tell you, you might not want to hear all of it, but it's important that if we're going to do this, we're, we're going to go really thorough. Uh, uh, and then you've got to work out how to, to phrase certain things. So, like, if I'm talking to you, like, I don't know, randomly on the phone or in a pub or something like that, I might say something in one way, but I wouldn't communicate it in that way to a player. I would say, like, you know, it's a work on or or this is maybe an area that they need to tighten up on. But they might also – I'll be identifying a lot of their kind of super strengths and stuff as well. So it's, it's really a, a combination of a lot of things where – You've you've got to really be good at communicating, and I definitely prefer it when players come to me rather than me having to do anything with them. Um, the the player pool as a group is very mixed in terms of their interest in analytics and their interest in interactions with analysts. So there will be players, and they literally will not give you the time of day. I've I've had a situation. I'm not going to lie to you had a situation where a player has basically sat in front of a load of other players, including me, and basically questioned why I'm even there. Like, so, you know, you, that's hard, right? That's How did you deal with that? Me, not very well, funnily enough. Um, I boiled it up for basically the whole comp. It was probably one of the hardest things I've had to deal with, actually, is in in, in these roles. But, but you have to realise, I mean, I, this was a while ago now, and you know, you've got the benefit of hindsight and benefit of coming through like heart surgery like I have recently and I've realised now that this person's meaningless to me. Like, like literally, I can care less what he thinks because you're never going to beat someone like that. You can tell them that the sky is blue and the grass is green, but they think the grass is blue and the sky is green. Like, literally, there's nothing you can do. So you just write them off. You just, that's what we can do. Um and but then there's but then there's some players who are absolutely amazing. They love it. I love the young players who come out come to you and they ask you really in depth stuff. I think because younger players are kind of growing up with technology a lot more and stuff that they understand computers and analytics and stuff a little bit more than the older player. And I mean, there's a few players right now. I won't name them, but they know pretty know who they are who have come to me. And like you only have to tell them once, and they get it. Like. I love that. That's so good. And then, you know, they might message you at the end of the tournament and say, you know, that's so much for everything. I really, really, really appreciate it. And then maybe they go off to overseas comps and stuff and do really well. And you, you actually take pride and really enjoy their career trajectory from there. It's 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 really pleasing in terms of like job satisfaction when when that happens. So it's it's a mixed bag, really. Um, how it's going to evolve, I think, is really interesting because. How I've all, I've already said that younger players are kind of you generally get more buy-in. So what we might see in the next ten years is sort of the, for want of a better phrase, dinosaurs getting out of the player pool, and younger players who are more interested coming in. What what I don't like, I've got to admit, is that when you have a player who isn't interested and is really struggling, but they don't reach out for any assistance or help. And they just kind of bury their head in the sand because if you don't want to use this stuff, fine. But you better can't play well because otherwise you're not being accountable for your decisions that you're making, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, a couple more questions, Dan, to finish us off. Finish finish us off. Uh, Aya on Twitter says, "Hi, Dan. How have you dealt with people who don't believe in data within the team management of a franchise, or wanted to sign players for marketing and or other reasons?" Um, so this is this is actually it's a similar question to the one about players here, uh, except that you you it might be a little bit harder to write off somebody who might ultimately be your boss just for being a dinosaur. So like, what's the what's the does I mean you know a straight up question here is does does this often happen? And then the follow up question from that is like is is there something that you can do? Look, I, I, I'll be honest, and and I don't agree with this at all. By the way, just just to get that out there to be very very clear. I, it the players get recruited not necessarily because, just solely because of their on pitch expected level of performance. I I, I don't like that. I, I want it to be a meritocracy, and I want players to get roles because they deserve it, 
rather than their reputation or name or branding ability or this, that, and the other, whatever it might be. I, I'm I'm very strong on like there being a kind of level playing field for everybody and everyone getting jo- uh, jobs and you know roles and teams because they really, really deserve it. Now, does it happen? Yes. Has it happened often to me? Not that often, but you do see it. Um, probably I would I would say that unless I've been really, really lucky, the average fan thinks it happens more than it actually does. So therefore, a lot of recruitment is just really bad because I've not seen it that much to be able to justify so many instances of really bad, weird recruitment. Um, but yeah, it definitely happens. And, and, and I, I'm not a fan because like, let's say, let's say for sake of argument, right? You're an IPL team. Now you have a fixed budget to spend at auction, right? So let's say you want to hire a guy because he's going to just plucking figures out of the air. You want to sign a player because he's going to get you a load of money off YouTube views, a load of shirts sold, a load of commercials, whatever it might be, yeah? What, what, where's that going to go? You cannot reinvest that money into your squad because you've got a fixed budget. It goes in the owner's pockets. That's, what, that's the only way it goes. So I, I, what blows my mind a lot of the time is when a fan tries to justify a player being paid X amount or signed for, for marketing reasons. It just doesn't make no sense. Like you, you don't see it happen very often in football at all. It's a much more evolved industry. I'm sure, it probably doesn't happen that often in baseball either. For same reason. You know, even if you're someone like someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, who's going to sell an absolute ton of shirts, or Messi, wherever you, you, they go, let's say for sake of argument, you're paying Messi ex, like a load of money a week, but you're making more than that back in shirt sales. You can then reinvest that money from the shirt sales back in your squad and buy more players. You can't do that in most cricket leagues. So what's the point? It just closes down his pocket. So if you're trying to build a successful on-pitch team, that runs counter to those objectives. And I actually really genuinely believe that any piece of recruitment that is not based on on-pitch performance or expected on-pitch performance is mutually exclusive with success. So if, if, if an owner says to you, right, we're going to buy this guy for marketing reasons, he then loses the right to have a go at you when results go wrong. I think that's fair. Dan, we've got one more question. Uh, and I think this is a really nice one to round things off for this episode. Uh, Dinesh says, what are the key competencies necessary to be a well-rounded individual in the practical application of the role of an in-person cricket analyst with a team? So he's he's basically asking you to summarise everything that we've talked about over the last two episodes. Yeah. Um, go for it. Good at data, understand numbers, good at presentation, good at communication, hard worker, Fits in well with a team environment. Um, literally, those those are, those are things that are all key. Um, basically, go from there. There you go. That's a that they're the bullet points for your CV, uh, Dinesh and Dan. No doubt, looks forward to receiving it. Um, <laughs> Dan, that's it for how to become a cricket analyst. I think we covered that in a lot of detail. Um, we're still planning out the next episode, so we don't know what it will be about, but you'll be able to find it when it hits the stream. If you like and subscribe or subscribe, follow uh, whichever on whichever platform that you are interested in, you can find me on Twitter at Jack Hope Zero, and you can find Dan on Twitter at SA Advantage. Um, Dan, you're probably the best one to follow from the perspective of getting a question on the next pod. Uh, uh, so yeah, like make sure you're, you're following him. Any final words from you, Dan, before we close the book on this topic? I just want to say thanks for listening. And, uh, I hope that it inspires you to, to go down this journey. If, if, if that's what you feel like you want to do, and it'd be great to hear success stories of people breaking into the industry. Just also want to say thanks to all your questions and support over this first couple of episodes where we've covered this topic and, uh, we'll be back soon with episode three and we'll ask for more topic suggestions and questions for that as well. Cheers. Goodbye, everyone.